So, um, first of all, um, just, just for my information, um, I've done um, story, I call it story of the Bible type stuff. Um, a couple times at these conferences, a couple times in churches. Um, is that ringing a bell with any of you that you've heard? Okay. So, could you look, you, I don't think so, but I can't remember everyone who's, sure. every, okay, so, um, so in that case, I don't have to be concerned about repeating myself, because this, this will be more new. So, uh, Story of the Bible is, um, uh, is something I've loved learning about uh, recently. Um, by Story of the Bible, need hardly be said, I don't mean like Story of Little Red Riding Hood, like it's not true, because it is true. Uh, that's the best thing about it, right. but um, but the Bible is not an encyclopedia. So um, um, so you know if you want to learn about the biblical doctrine of separation, you don't look under S, do you? Or like the church wouldn't be like you you go to like the letter C. Page, a couple more pages, you got to get to C H C H U, and right. then you're, okay, there, you're there, there you are, and everything about the church. Um, so uh, that's not how the Bible is arranged, but we know that whatever God does, he does well. So there must be a reason why God has arranged the Bible in a way that is more story-like and less encyclopedia-like um, or systematic theology-like, and and I don't. And systematic theology is not wrong. That's just a way to try to top, look at topics, to try to summarize what we learn across the Bible. But apparently, the ideal is more of a story format. So let's talk a little bit about story format. Um, you have um, a um, here's a basic model that maybe you've seen. Is um, you have um, a setting, um, and then you have, um, sometimes it's called uh, the inciting moment, uh, inciting as in uh, stirring up to action or something, and then you have um, rising action, so this is setting, um, inciting moment, rising action, um, and then climax, and then uh, falling action, and uh, resolution, or denouement, or, um, or is that the right word? Anyway, um, so um, how many people here know um, line and witch and wardrobe? Raise your hand. Um, so okay, so so most of us. So um, the setting would be World War Two. The children have to go off to the countryside to get away from the German bombers, uh, and so they're in this kind of strange big house. And then the inciting moment is they go through the wardrobe, and then the rising action is uh, now they're in a new place. And then they discover all is not well in this world. Uh, and there's this wicked witch. And I forget everything. But so somehow they get around to work around uh, um, uh, killing the witch and making everything right in this world. And so that's that would be the climax. And then the falling action would be now they are high kings and queens of Narnia and things go great and so on and it's not a big part of the book because i think it's just like a couple pages but that's the falling action and that's typical the falling action usually is not many words although sometimes the amount of time can be very um a lot of time and a few words and that's one thing about stories is there's a flexibility in stories where we can describe and then many years went by. In years of peace. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So in like in like seven words, we can have seventy years, or we can take um, one event and talk about it and talk about it. So um, it, uh, it's called there's like narrative time and then real time or lapse time. And so in the Gospels, 
you have like if you take like gospel of john you have mm-hmm. one one is like eternity <laughs> in uh, one verse yeah. and then you have several chapters about the garden crucifixion uh well actually um not just that but jesus's last discourses uh in uh the upper room and so on um basically jesus's last three days and then his, his resurrection take up many many chapters versus all of eternity past takes one verse in the gospel of john so the amount of time something takes in like real time you might say and the amount of time it takes to tell that story can be different things it's falling action off and not much time and then resolution is in narnia the children come um, back to england and so um um they you know step back through the wardrobe and they're back their original ages and all these things um but if you're familiar with the story they're not really the same children at heart are they like they're the same ages and things they look the same like no no you know somehow in this magical realm like no time really went by when they were in there but then when they come out they're not the same people because all this happened and so they've changed um, and um, often um, a um, resolution will in some ways bring you full circle back to the beginning of the story. But normally, if not always, um, the, the, um, the full circle is at the same time a bit of a change over the beginning so in some, so it's full circle in that here they are back in england again you know where the where we left them at the inciting moment in england and world war ii is going on and so on and their kids of certain ages and so on and then at the end all those things are true again but at the same time they're different for having had the experiences that they had um uh, how about how many guys are familiar with um, uh, with say the Hobbit? Okay, so um, so Bilbo is a stay in his Hobbit hole kind of guy, uh, and uh, then inciting moment, this wizard comes and says, "We're signing you up for an adventure. You're gonna go slay a dragon." And uh, so the rising action is this great journey until finally they get to the mountain. And uh, they slay the dragon, um, uh, and um, the falling action is in that book rather long, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, even more so on like the Lord of the Rings is the falling action is unusually long. So maybe that's something that marks Tolkien out a little bit as his falling action is rather lengthy. Um, and so the falling action is his journey back home, and at the end, Bilbo's where in this hobbit hole and uh that's where he lives and that's where he lived in the beginning and uh this problem with the dragon's not there anymore so in some ways it's full circle back to the beginning in other ways uh he's changed he's a different hobbit for having had this adventure okay so what about the bible and for a moment for a moment at least let's not just do the old testament let's do the whole thing so the setting is God creates a world, and it's perfect, and it's good, uh, and um, he um, he creates man uh, in his image, and he blesses them, and he says, um, let them rule uh, over the creation of the earth. Um, and... Um, and then he takes, uh, Adam and brings him to the garden of Eden in order. Scripture says in chapter two of Genesis that he might work it and keep it or, or cultivate the garden. Um, Adam was never meant to just sit around under the trees all day doing nothing. He had a job to do. Um, and he was to be God's image bearer in this garden, probably his offspring. And and maybe we'll get back to this, uh, later on probably his offspring were not going to stay in the garden uh or at least not all of them 
but actually go out and build cities. Um, so perhaps we'll come back to that thought and explore that a little better, or we might not have time today, but um, he's, man has created a rule. Um, man especially is created to uh, work. Um, and then um, comes our inciting moment, which would be what? The fall, the the snake comes and tempts them, and sin enters into the world, and now man cannot be God's image bearer fully because of sin. He can't rule the way God intends him to, uh, and his relationship is, is shattered. Um, so now, uh, and then um, in, in that... Um, Usually, usually in a story, um, once you in the inciting moment or pretty soon afterward, um, you generally get a a fairly clear goal in mind. Uh, it, it's not always equally clear, but but uh, and it's not always directly stated. But usually, there's some kind of a goal in mind of slay the dragon, um, kill the wicked wicked witch. Or if it's like a whodunit novel, the goal is find out who murdered Mrs. So-and-so, you know. Um, so some kind of a goal in mind. Um, in this case, um, God says um, to the serpent, um, um, I will... Um, it will it's, it's three read it. Yeah, yes, Genesis um, 3, 15 and, and uh, 16, I think goes along with it. Um, uh, God says to the, the snake, um, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. And, and that could be translated, though you shall bruise him on the heel. So you have this, this imagery of, uh, he shall bruise you on the heel. It's like a, a snake grab, you know, where would a snake tend to latch onto somebody as their heel. But then if that heel comes down on the snake's head, is how's it going to go for the snake? So this the man with the heel coming down is going to be wounded, but the head snake is going to be smashed. So the snake will be defeated, although the man will be wounded. This man is going to be the seed of the woman. Now we kind of we know where this is going. Uh, the seed of the woman is Jesus born of a virgin. What's the wounding? The cross. Uh, but, you know, how much of that did they know? You know, what this entailed. But this, this, um, this verse, uh, and you're right, it is 3.15, Genesis 3.15. This is, this is the, the goal setting. So the, the inciting moment is kind of the whole incident of the fall. You could say all of chapter 3. Um, the goal setting is specifically 3.15 of... Uh, God promises that a seed of the woman is going to come who is going to crush the serpent who caused all this problem by implication. Crushing the serpent means solving the problem of sin and what this has done to God's rule through humanity uh, into the world. So then we have this um, rising action. And the climax would be the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then, interestingly, where are we? We're in the falling action. Um, and in some ways, the New Testament from the book of Acts uh, through the epistles, let's say, uh, well, maybe we should say through most of Revelation, is the falling action. Um, now, the, the falling action is not always necessarily easygoing. In Narnia, it is. Because, uh, well, maybe there's, there might be some references to, like, they fight some wars and so on. Like, summarized in a sentence, they fought some wars and were successful or something like that. Um, in, in, like, Lord of the Rings, the falling action there. Yeah, I mean, so it's not all nice, is it? And so, in a similar way, <laughs> not to uh, be sacrilegious, but in a similar way, um, we are in technically a falling action part of the story we here in this room. 
because the climax has already happened. The, the ages have turned on the cross. Um, and yet, here we are. <laughs> We're still in the outworking of all of this. Um, so then that, now the resolution would be the new heaven and new earth. And think about the new heaven and the new earth. It says that uh, there's a river. And does that sound kind of like something? There's We didn't read it, but in the Garden of Eden, there's a river splitting out four directions. A tree. There's a tree there. Um, fruit. Uh, and you can just go thing after thing between the Garden of Eden and the New Jerusalem. Thing after thing. Just so many parallels. Curiously, though, it's not a garden, is it? It's a city. But what was the command to man in the beginning? Be fruitful and multiply. You don't, um, you don't have uh, masses of people in a garden, do you? Cities are where you have lots of people. Uh, and and uh, so, just to drop a few more hints in this direction, um, a city was probably what God intended, cities maybe, all along, for mankind to build, construct, uh, learn, explore, uh, and populate the earth. Um, so we have a, a, a city. Um, you might call it the new city because it's the new Jerusalem. It's more specific than the new city because there's obviously a lot of significance to Jerusalem. But the fact that it's a city coming down from God, from, uh, from God, from heaven, the fact that it's a city, um, right now we have cities, but the cities we see now are basically high concentrations of sinners. And that's why they're places we tend to uh, avoid. And, and not, not everyone, but a lot of people would say, most people I ask, you know, you don't really like cities. Uh, well, you know, why is that? A lot of it has to do with, some of it is nature, you know, and, and maybe that's the way we go about building our cities, that perhaps is less than what God intended, because God is a God of beauty. And uh, we tend not to build very nice-looking cities all the time. Um, but a lot of it is cities are high-density sin <laughs> locations. A lot of sinners in close quarters, and so it doesn't get along well. But what if all these sinners were redeemed and uh, glorified people? So the, the, the New Jerusalem. Furthermore, man was created uh, to rule. Genesis 126. Uh, the image of God, and theologians, you know, talk at length about what is that image, you know, is it intellect, is it emotion, as well. And we could have that discussion, and it's an interesting discussion that leads to more questions than answers. But the important thing is the image of God is given to man so that man can rule. This and it's it's just it's really emphasized in Genesis 1 is that uh, man is meant to rule. Man's also meant to work. But then, and I, I skipped over this before, in Genesis 3, when the consequences of sin are meted out, uh, for Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you shall work. Man's still going to work, but now it's going to be frustrating and painful and arduous. Um, woman was always meant to be the helper. We see that in Genesis 2. Always meant to bear children, you know, at least in a, on a normal course, some uh, you know, some women, God means to be virgins. Some are meant to be barren. But in the normal course of things, women bear children. Uh, that was always intended. But now it is in pain and with sorrow that you're going to bear children. It's a very difficult process uh, of childbirth. And then child rearing is often so difficult. Um, and so um, now there's sweat and tears and anguish as man tries to go about what we were meant to do and nothing is quite going to work. When we get to, um, um, we can, from Genesis, there's number one, rule. Um, the image of God said that they may rule. Number two, man is meant to work. And then number three, the curse makes things harder. When we get to Revelation 21, 22, one of the first things we see is... Um, there is no more curse. It wipes away every tear, and it says very specifically, there is no more curse. And then it says his, his bond servants will serve him. And 
we paraphrase to cultivate, you know, or, uh, his bond servants will serve him. So in heaven too, we'll not be sitting around on clouds strumming harps because I used to be terrified as a child of heaven. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was, I, uh, I understood I needed a savior, but heaven, ooh, you know, it sounded scary to just sit around for millions of years on a cloud with, and that's it. That just sounds so boring, but <laughs> no need to fear. That's not true. Heaven is going to be a place of activity uh, and, um, and, uh, and work, which is what we were meant to do. Uh, and then uh, finally, it says um, they will rule with him. So in reverse order, we have in Revelation 21 and 22, the undoing of, or the, 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 the undoing of the curse and of sin and a uh, restoration of um, what God intended uh, in the beginning. Um, in that respect, it's a bringing full circle. At the same time, are things exactly the way they were with Adam and Eve in the garden when we look at what will be in the New Jerusalem? Actually, it's much better. We've, we have not only been created by God, carefully created and breathed into and so on, we've been redeemed by the blood of his son. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the scope of our activity will be far greater and our surroundings will be much more magnificent um, if the size of the new jerusalem is to be taken literally not merely symbolically um it, it that's like a big chunk of the united states is just that city and um it's kind of hard to fit that in the middle east <laughs> could it be that the whole earth is going to be proportionately bigger proportionately sized relative to that that would be pretty big. Um, Jerusalem's not that big a city today. And if you, whatever Still. multiplier you have to put in there to get the new, and then you apply that same multiplier to the rest of the earth. Um, I don't know if that's how it'll be or not, but certainly um, there's going to be fantastic opportunity for exploration, for learning, uh, for growth. Um, when I believe when we see Jesus, we will know him in a very personal way, and it'll be a new depth to our relationship with him, like he has with us. It'll be bi-directional more than it's now, it's more one, much more one-directional at the moment. But that, that doesn't mean that we'll be omniscient, and I think that can be demonstrated from scripture. Um, you have, in Revelation, you have the souls under the altar asking how long, They've all been martyred, but they they don't know the answer to this question, else they wouldn't ask it, and they're also concerned, so they still have a vested interest. They still are curious, more than curious. They're intensely concerned about seeing God's justice, you know, take place. So when we won't know everything, and you might say I'm disappointed, I think that's actually a good thing, because God built us to cultivate to. You know, learn how the different plants work, how they respond, how they. Um, so you know, we're going to be very busy, um, and a good kind of busy. <laughs> um, so the New Jerusalem is in some ways bringing us back, but in some ways making things um, so much better. So that's that's kind of really, um, really big picture, um, and sticking with. The Bible is a whole for at least a moment longer. You can even, you can sort of um, go zoom in just slightly from that and still see a lot of these sort of mirror images. So um, if, if this is uh, Genesis here, and suppose we, so to speak, flip a few pages, we get to um, Babel. Uh, now, supposing this is the last page of Revelation right here, and we were to flip back a couple of pages, what we would find here is the fall of Babel, Revelation 17, 18. So Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, it's a couple pages in from the beginning, a couple pages back from the end, the fall of Babel. 
Um, the first poem is a couple chapters in, um, and it's uh, man boasting in his pride. It's Lamech talking to his wives in Genesis uh, 4, I think it is. Uh, the last poem of the Bible is Revelation 18, the, again, the fall of Babel, and lamenting the, the, the catastrophic failure of all of man's great enterprises. Um, and it, there's just, there's lots and lots of things like that. Um, when, when, um, when you're, when you're, as far as the, the bar reminds me of, uh, here's, here's one technique to think of is if, um, if like creation or, you know, Genesis is here and then the, the new earth slash revelation is here. When you're reading in your Bible, um, try to figure out where in this line are you. So, like, if you're reading about, say, you know, the life of Jacob, um, you're over here. Um, if you're reading about Paul, you're, like, over here. Um Yes, for and and if if you're, um, let's say, let's say you know David, um, you know we'll, you know put him like there, and then you draw this line, and everything after this is what you don't know. So you know if you you sit, if you put yourself in David's shoes, it's like you you kind of know this, but you haven't seen you know any of that, basically. So. Of where are you in the the unfolding of, of uh, scripture? Um, let's let's um so let's now let's start back at the beginning. Um, and um, with a with a focus on the Old Testament. Um, in Genesis chapter one, um, God creates a world, a universe. Uh, just with his his word, and he orders it. Uh, he orders it properly. He makes distinctions between things. He says uh, things are good. Um, in uh, verse um, twenty six, uh, he says, "Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth." It's as though God is the emperor of a vast universe. And like an emperor might delegate responsibility over a province or a city to some responsible governor or mayor, he is delegating authority over this corner of his universe to man. It happens to be the corner of the universe that gets the most attention. You know, the, the stars are mentioned in just a couple words, but then the earth is, you know, all this chapter and more. Um, in chapter 2, um, he gives man uh, the charge to cultivate the garden, also the charge to name the animals. And so God is actually helping to carry out, I'm sorry, man is helping to carry out God's organizational scheme. So man is God's image bearer, naming the animals, giving a, uh, you know, an order and, and so on to God's creation. Um, and um, also in chapter two, um, God... Um, sees that uh, something so far is not good, and that's for Adam to be alone. Uh, and uh, it's very important to look for repetition as you read Scripture. So the repetition, God saw it was good, and it was it was good. You know, and of course, you, and it was so, and it was so, and it was so, over and over, just drills in. When God says something, it's this is how it is, God's authority. Um, but also, several times, God creates things that he sees it's good. And then the first time something's not good, and it's that man needs uh, a woman um, to compliment him. Um, and um, there's uh, a lot we might say about that, but try to try to pick up on the main threads here. Woman is made as uh, a helper to him. So man is man is to rule mankind. Human beings are to rule over the earth, all the animals therein. Um, Woman is to help man. The females, the males, in a in a wife to husband relationship, um, and uh, um, 
they are in a good relationship uh, and things are good. And then comes chapter three. And what happens in chapter three? Um, a snake and probably indwelled by Satan. But we don't know that yet as we're just, you know, um, they, one, one, one thing I've heard from a history professor is in studying history, one of the most important things is to forget what you know. You know, so as you're reading about Germany in the 1930s, we know, like, where that went with the Holocaust and so on. But, but you have to, for, when you're studying, you have to forget. And you have to realize, you know, German, most Germans in 1933, they did not know that that was going to happen. And, uh, and, and so, likewise here, like, we don't know, you know, where this is all going. Um, so, um, it is Satan, but in the form of or indwelling a snake, which is an animal. So, an animal comes, and who does he approach? The woman. And uh, when she is deceived, she approaches who? Her husband. Um, and so what do we have here is a reversal of it was supposed to be um, um, male to female. And this is not importance. This is just God's order. So we know that female from Scripture, females and males are of equal importance, but importance and role are different. God the Father and God the Son are equally God and equally important. But the father has an authority over the son. So male, human, animals. And then in chapter 3, we have an animal tells the woman what to do. And she tells the man what to do. So God's created order has been turned on its head. Um, the man instantly knew full well what was going on. The woman got tripped up. And so, a bit of an aside from the, the you know the main thread, but um, in First Timothy, Paul draws out that the um, that Eve was deceived, Adam was not. Meaning Adam was in full possession of his senses when he disobeyed God. He knew exactly what he was doing, but he went along with it. Why? Um, peer pressure. Um, and uh, um, so why should women not be pastors or otherwise teachers, at least in the church? And I would argue elsewhere as well, at least when it comes to adults. Why is that the case? One reason, there's, there's at least two reasons. One is from the beginning, God created women as a support role. Support is not less important than leading. It's just different. Uh, it's not of less value. But that was God's intention all the way from the beginning in chapter 2. Also, um, Paul cites that Eve was deceived uh, in, by the snake. So apparently women are more easily tripped up than men. That doesn't mean that men always do the right things, because we tend to be bullheaded and do exactly what we know is a bad idea. Uh, but women tend to be spiritually tripped up. When you look at um, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons... Um, a lot of the wildest and wackiest of Greek cults that, you know, we won't really talk about what they did. Who were their primary members, or their most numerous members, I should say, women. Most Jehovah's Witnesses are women uh, and Mormons. And it's kind of bizarre when you think about how they treat women, how they think of women. But uh, that's how it goes. Uh, so a reversal of God's order. Um, and so in... Um, the consequences, as we noted, God takes um, what people were meant to be and makes it harder. So um, for um, the snake, now he's going to go on his belly. Whether he had legs before or wings, um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, and then um, the man uh, is um, going to have uh, thorns and thistles. Now, if it weren't there before, the sweat of his brow, the woman is going to have um, uh, anguish uh, and pain and bearing children. Um, your desire will be 
for your husband than as we translate. It's probably a better translation would be against your husband. Um, that um, that uh, yet he will rule over you. Um, so God created women to be in a support role, but now she's not going to want that. There's going to be a natural kicking against the authority, a natural the woman wants to be the leader uh, in the relationship. Um, yet the man is going to rule over her. You look across cultures, across continents, across religions, across societies, and the mistreatment of women by men is just, it's part of the curse. So um, in highly uh, learned societies, uh, you know, learned in air quotes, um, uh, female babies are aborted much more often than males. Uh, so, you know, in places where they claim to have, you know, overcome religion and, you know, are more moral than the Bible and so on, they'd rather kill a girl baby than a boy baby. And, and it's just, you know, they, they want to put it in such bald terms, but it's this it's this curse working itself out. Um, but so the your desire will be against your husband. Now there's going to be friction in the relationship. Um, and um, so now everything that people's meant to be is skewed and broken because the order of, this is fitting because the order of creation was turned on its head uh, by uh, what happened um, in God's holiness he sends them out of out of the garden but he promises he says this in 315 I'll put and between and between between you talking to the snake and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise you on the heel. Suddenly there's there's a certain seed. And here's an important point, and we'll hopefully come back to this uh, in, in a moment, in a couple of moments. The word seed in Hebrew uh, and coming through into English um, can refer either as a collective to a number of offspring. Um, so the seed of Abraham is many. There are many Jewish people down through history descended physically from him. Or it can refer to one single offspring. At first, this is a bit ambiguous. Her seed, does that mean like all her descendants? But then when it says he, we were talking about a certain one. And then as we mentioned before, the, the seed of the woman, what exactly does that mean? I don't think they understood, and we'll see that uh, in chapter 4. Um, but ultimately, I believe it's the virgin birth. Um, certainly being descended, certainly coming from a woman physically as Jesus did. Um, and uh, he shall bruise you on the head, though, be a better translation, though you bruise him on the heel. And so again, the, the cross there. But we're, but of course, we don't know it's the cross yet. We don't know, it, we don't have that fleshed out. And yet, and yet, it is there, isn't it? And when you come to places like Isaiah 53, where he's going to suffer and be afflicted and so on, does that not echo what's hinted at here. Uh, and so, in some ways, this verse sets up the rest of the Old Testament and all the way, <laughs> all the way, really, I mean, this is this is just so important. So the, the first couple chapters of the Bible are just so important in, in setting up the flow of what's to come. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, now, so we're waiting for this. Um, we're waiting for this guy. So then we come to chapter four. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, "I've gotten a man child with the help of the Lord." Uh, a man child. That's not a word we use very often. Uh, and uh, the, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting thing because. Um, Possibly there'd be better ways to translate it than using the word man-child, because uh, when's the last time we ever used <laughs> that word? Uh, but the thing is, it is weir wordly, uh, weirdly worded. Weirdly worded. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. It is weirdly worded in Hebrew. Um, it is odd. See, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And, and I think um, what she's getting at is, it's a male. Not that males are better, but that it's a he that they're waiting for. The seed of the woman, he will crush the seed of the snake. And so she outcomes baby boy. There he is. He's here. 
And uh, so Cain, I've gotten him. He's 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 here. He's 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 come. He's come into this world. And then verse two again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And the wording in Hebrew, I'm not certain about this, but it seems strongly to suggest that um, she continued in childbirth. I.e., these are twins. I'm not 100 percent on that. It might be on a later occasion, but it could mean that they're twins. But either way. The second son is named Abel, which is Hebrew for um, nothing or vanity or emptiness. And why would you name your son that? Um, I think because they're confused. Why do we need two? Because it was a he <laughs> who's kind of who's this is so this is a little bit disconcerting. Isn't one enough? Because he's gonna. So how come there's a second one here? Particularly if it's a twin situation. Uh, that's uh, you know, it's a little puzzling. Uh, seems like one would do the trick. Uh, he, not they. So we're wondering, yeah, were they right about Cain? Or maybe it's going to be Abel? Or um, I, It seems like maybe they think it's going to be Cain and Abel, sort of a leftover something that's going to fix this problem. So which one does? Cain or Abel? <laughs> well, so Cain kills Abel. So... Cain can't be it because he's a murderer. Not a he's not sinless. He's a murderer, and Abel can't be it because he's dead. Right. So um, the here's here's going back to a story of the Bible. Um, would a a a a, a story a good story a good story is not um, setting and setting moment, and then they fixed everything. The end. <laughs> like there's got to be some kind of you know, some kind of like, um, you know, like, you know, Lord of the Rings, like, you know, Gandalf tells, tells Frodo, you know, this is the one ring. It must be destroyed. Oh, look, you've got a fireplace. Put it in there and we'll, and, oh, okay. And put it in and melts and the end. They all live happily ever. You know, that's not, that's not a, <laughs> it's not a good story, is it? Um, and so good stories, not only just that, just that they're more than, more than like three pages probably, but that, that, um, you hit roadblocks, you know, and as you, if, you know, if you, uh, you know, probably everyone at some point has seen an action movie, you know, of some sort. And in the, in the action movies, um, whether or not you've thought of it this way, uh, a lot of the times the the plot is often like mind-blowingly simple um and it's like it's bare elements the thing is every time you think that they're about to fix the problem some monkey wrench gets thrown in there and uh you know and then sometimes like you think the movie's over and then suddenly boom you know something happens it's not over yet because you know they got some twist to throw in there um and part of the excitement at times and at other times frustration maybe of reading the Bible and seeing the Bible unfold in our own lives is that for whatever reasons that go to his glory, um, God um, puts unexpected roadblocks in the way where we think we're making progress and, and we are because God's plan is, is unfolding. Yet when to our eyes the solution seems imminent precisely at that moment, something comes to seemingly thwart our progress and frustrate us. And so now we've got, you know, the two sons and one is dead and one is a murderer. Um, but then God gives Seth and Seth is Hebrew for replacement, which, you know, seems like kind of a heartless thing to name a, a child or a replacement for somebody else. But understood in this context, it does make sense. Um, and so now we can anticipate that surely it's going to be through Seth, that Seth himself or one of his children is going to be the one to crush the serpent. So we, we read on and things get um, worse. We have a man for this first time marry two wives. And this is where the first poem of the Bible comes in, as I mentioned before. Uh, and his pride, the last poem will be um, lamenting the fall of man's pride um and then um we keep going along and then there's this man noah and um 
in Genesis 5, verses 28 through 29, Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Noah means rest. Um, this one will give us rest um, from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. So he seems to think this Noah is going to be the one to reverse the curse. And again, forgetting what we know, we find that this man is somebody who walks with God. We find that it's to him that the Lord turns when the sin of man is so great that he needs to send a flood. And, and you know, at one level, when, when we first are reading, we might think, God, if God's done with humanity, I mean, if the God's done with humanity, the story doesn't work because what God set out to do doesn't come to fruition. Well, you know, and, and to be clear, what is God setting out to do? What God is setting out to do is to restore mankind to rule. Uh, and he gets glory in doing that. Ultimately, how he gets glory in doing that, how he brings this about, is Christ. Uh, and so... Um, but the, so we're waiting for this man and, and we think it might be Noah and it's through Noah that mankind is preserved. Uh, and he, you know, we, we think of Noah and we think of his trust and, uh, and it's, it's phenomenal. And then he plants a guard, a vineyard and gets ravingly drunk and then lies down naked and terrible things happen. Um, so we're disappointed. I, you know, we're disappointed that uh, we we kind of might we might have had hopes in Noah. At least his father did. We might have had hopes in Noah. He lets us down, and that's going to be a pattern that continues um, uh, when we get to David. Um, David does so great. Um, and then David and Bathsheba, and he lets us down. When we go to here's here's a book you might not expect in these in this connection is is Isaiah. When you are reading through Isaiah, in the initial chapters, you'll see the king at the time is Ahaz, and he's being threatened by an alliance of Syrians and Israelites, the northern Jewish kingdom, and he refuses. To trust God. You know, God says, I will take care of you. Just believe me. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he concocts the scheme to try to get everything to work out. And so all through the first chapters of Isaiah, we're just seeing man's concoctions and not trusting God, not trusting God. Well, then Ahaz has a son, Hezekiah. And under Hezekiah's rule, we have the Assyrians come in, and the Assyrians make the, the Syrians look like nothing. Uh, and the Assyrians sweep through, surround Jerusalem, and they are quite literally going to tear the Jerusalem lights into itty-bitty pieces. Um, but Hezekiah trusts God, and the city is miraculously delivered. So this is great. He's a son of David, and he's finally somebody who trusts God implicitly. And then we see him showing off his riches to the Babylonians. He's proud. He's arrogant. And um, he lets us down. So time and again, we have these people that we pin our hopes on, and then uh, they let us down. Um, and so that's a, that's a recurring feature. But back to Noah. Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Um, um, Ham is complicit in uh, the sin um, that comes about in part because of Noah's own foolishness. So either Shem or Japheth would appear to be people through whom to look to find this coming one who's going to crush the serpent's head. Um, and uh, then the, the narrative kind of holds out on telling us much about Shem. And that's kind of a clue as you read through scriptures. A lot of times 
the writers will kind of hold out on you on something because it's it's like wait so it first tells us a lot about Ham and Japheth and holds out on Shem because it's through Shem that Abram comes. Um, now I have just about used up my time, but let me turn to a passage here, um, Genesis chapter twelve. This is this is um, one of the most important chapters in the Old uh, Testament is Genesis chapter 12. Uh, Abram's a descendant of Shem. And uh, uh, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who curse you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Um, here's this, this passage here, um, particularly verse 2, Genesis 12, 2. Um, it's hardly exaggerating to say that this verse sets the trajectory for the rest of the Old Testament. Here's my attempt to make it memorable. Um, I'm going to call it the ABCs of the Old Testament. Uh, God promises um, Abram three things, and we can put them under uh, the headings A, B, and C. So the A is allotment. Um, I'm not certain that's spelled right, but A L L O T M E N T. I don't know. I think it's spelled right. However you spell it, <laughs> allotment. A for allotment. Go to a land. I guess that's in verse one. Um, go to the land, or probably better translated, a land that I will show you. It's a specific land, but he doesn't know what it is yet. Um, go to a land which I will show you. And uh, the theme of the land is so dominant in the rest of the Old Testament. Much of the prophets are reiterating what it says in the Pentateuch, when we get to the, the law later on. Um, but if I forget, if I if I forget, um, which which I might well do, um, Deuteronomy thirty two is another one of the absolutely key texts in the Old Testament. So if you're taking notes, Deuteronomy thirty two is really really important. Um, Deut yeah, chapter thirty two of Deuteronomy, chapter thirty two is uh, is another really important text for setting the trajectory for the Old Testament. If the people of Israel are faithful. They have the privilege, not the right, but the privilege of remaining in the land. Uh, if they're not faithful, uh, then they must leave the land, except that Deuteronomy 32 says, you will be unfaithful, so you will have to leave the land, but I will bring you back. And so God's grace, uh, God's, God's is going, he is going to work through whom he's going to work, even though they don't deserve it. Um, the, the land of Canaan, Palestine, whatever you want to call it, land of Israel, this can be thought of as a microcosm of the earth. That in Genesis, in Genesis 1, um, God has this vast universe in his power, but he delegates a little corner of it, but a special corner of it, the earth, to his image bearers, mankind. This image, however, is marred by sin. But starting in Genesis 12, we begin to see, and as Abraham, as God continues to communicate with Abraham, you see the, the references, the Canaanites then living in the land and so on, that there's this expectation of how Abram is to show the Canaanites what life is supposed to be like as one walks with God. And then later it's going to be even more explicitly described as that Israel is to be a light unto the nations. Um, the land of Israel is supposed to be a microcosm of earth, this little piece of land where the rest of the world is to see what God can do with image bearers who, who really image him in a place delegated to them. Um, yet, as just mentioned, we're also going to see they fail to do that on their own. And so they need God's redemption, God's, God's interposition of blood, uh, ultimately of Jesus's blood, to make them worthy even of that role. So A is for allotment, and which is my way of making a, getting a letter A out of land, the land of Israel, an allotment, a piece of real estate in which to show the rest of the world what all the world was meant to be. 
uh, the rest of mankind, what all mankind was meant to be. The B is for blessing. I will bless you. And there is, um, there is certainly here and certainly in the next one a dual element to this promise. On the one hand, the blessing is in what we would recognize as tangible ways. For example, the, the number of uh, science prize winners for the Nobel um, Institution for you know, science prizes and chemistry and physics and medicine and these things, um, as well as art and so on, um, that has gone to Jewish people is enormous. Jewish Nobel Prize winners. Jewish, a lot of times you don't know that they're Jewish because they changed their name so that it's not embarrassing. Um, they don't want to be embarrassed by being widely known as Jewish. But the, the, the trend centers, trend setters, culturally, the businessmen, um, I'm not saying there's this secret group of Jews that controls all the world's finances, but their, their, um, their impact, that, like what is the percentage of Jewish people to the percentage of humanity? You know, I don't know what it is. It's got to be like 0.0000. This is what, like approaching 7 billion people in the world. And um, there's, there's like 12 million people that know that they're Jews, and there might be more that are the lost tribes, and they don't know that they're Jewish, but... You know, um, you know, several million out of several billion, it's not that many in percentage terms, yet the impact they've had. So there's that sense of blessing, but there's another sense of blessing that in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And in the New Testament, it connects this to Christ, that Christ is the ultimate blessing. And through the fathers, as Paul says, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, through David, according to the flesh, Romans chapter 1, Christ comes to the world, and the blessing of Christ and the redemption that's in him comes to all the nations of the world through Abram. So blessing. And then the C, I had to cheat. The C is this. Seed. So, because the letter C can sound like an S sometimes, and so that's the best I could do. Seed. So again, two senses of seed. One is, he's going to have a lot of children. One man who is very old, he's going to have a lot of children. And, and uh, um, you know, true proportionally to the rest of the world, not, not so very many. And yet, co considering coming from one man, and even taken on its own terms, you know, many millions of people today. And had the Holocaust not happened, you know, how many people would there be? Um, given a thousand years of peace, uh, how many Jewish people could there be? Uh, you know, given large growth rates and so on as part of God's blessing on them. And yet, there's another sense to this seed. A certain one, a he, not, not only, there is a they, the Jewish people, but also a he, a he that's going to come uh, from um, Abram. And, as, and, and then specifically, as we go through um, the Old Testament, and we're waiting for these things to happen, but in particular for the one seed. Uh, and we continue to sort of narrow the line. We continue to be disappointed at times. Um, sometimes we're surprised. If you read through Genesis and you get into the latter chapters, if, you, if you're able to forget what you know, um, here's, what you, here's what you might think of Jacob's children, his many children. Which one of them is the, is the offspring going to come from? Which one of, as you go through the story, um, well, um, a bunch of the children, uh, some of them try to kill Joseph. Others are okay with selling him. None of them seem too promising. But Joseph, he's faithful, and he rises from the slave uh, pit to being second in command over Egypt. Um, he saves the Jewish nation and other nations um, as a blessing to the earth uh, by his foresight and so on. So, great. Here's the man through whom the Messiah is going to come. Well, no, actually, Judah. Uh, Judah, who, who conceives offspring through his daughter-in-law. Uh, and it's through that line that the Messiah is going to come. So, surprises, uh, twists, turns. Um, and obviously, we <laughs> did not make it very far. Um, but um, if you can keep this trajectory in mind, um, 
and think about as you you can attempt to cut or categorize. Like I say, you've got uh, a colored Bible, um, and um, um, and he's got. If you haven't seen something like that before, different topics and different colors. Um, so one thing you can sort of like in your mind do is try to color different parts of the Old Testament in whatever color you would give A and then B and then C and uh, and sort of sort of see what happens um, uh, when you um, the the gospel that uh, is the most explicit I would say in connecting to the story of the Bible overall is Luke and it's really neat in Luke um, what is as you turn the first few pages of Luke what are some things that happen angels talk to people like in Abraham and Sarah they have various encounters with angels and then you've got an old man and an old woman too old for children and then there's an announcement you're going to have a son mm. and does this sound kind of and it, it oh this sounds like Abraham and Sarah and it's like God is beginning to move again and uh, um, viewed in that light it's uh, it's exciting